was responsible for, unfortunately, a lot of unethical business practices, right? So if you can imagine companies were adhering to this idea of it's all about the bottom line, you know, and what would you do to make sure that you, um, you increase that bottom line? You can imagine some of the business practices that went along with that. And so in marketing, um, marketing became very, very rooted in deception and manipulation. And deservedly so, marketers started being um, perceived as, as these uh, evil puppeteers, right? That would do and say anything to get you to buy their products. And for a long time, you know, companies were able to get away with that. And that was largely because customers knew very little about companies and brands. You know, I always use my parents as an example. You know, they used to buy products. The only thing they knew was the name of the company, how much the product cost, and if it worked. And they didn't care to know any more than that, right? However, things changed. As technology progressed, the access to information progressed with it. And along with that became a more informed consumer. And we're at a point now where consumers not only know everything there is to know about these companies and these brands, they actually expect full transparency. And so that opened up a lot of companies' eyes to a different approach. You know, the, the bottom line was no longer enough. Now we're seeing a shift towards this triple bottom line approach to business and marketing, where profit, people, and planet are all equally important. So make as much money as you can, as long as you do good by people and do good by the planet. Now, if we fast forward, if I'm a brand and I care about profit people and planet, or at least I want to um, send out the, per the perception, I want to create the perception that I care, and we find ourselves in the midst yet again of a, of a social narrative that we have to decide whether we're going to get involved with, right? And so when, when an occurrence like this happens, a lot of brands have to make a decision about whether they're going to get involved in this narrative or not, and how to become involved in this narrative. And so once we have these, the, the current day Black Lives Matter movement in protest, brands decided that, you know what, we have to say something. And a lot of brands ended up saying something like this, right, where this is, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, but we all seen this post all over the place. Not this joke of a post, actual companies that were substituting their brand names out and basically running campaigns similar to this. But on the other end, we've seen other companies that kind of went all in from the other side of this narrative, right? And took very, very hard stances, right? And communicated very, very strong messages. And yet and still, we had a lot of companies and brands that did this, absolutely nothing. Remained silent, took no action at all. That kind of led us to um, the idea of this webinar. Dr. St. Clair and I kind of had a conversation about this and we were like, man, what do companies do? Who, who should engage? How should they engage? And, you know, to be honest, I didn't know the answer. Dr. St. Clair knew some of the answers, but we thought, you know, what? we know some super smart people that probably know more of the answers than us. And that led us to the idea of creating this webinar and inviting this panel of, of expert uh, branders and expert um, communicators. And so with that, I kind of want to introduce, you know, our panel of, of experts. First, please let me introduce from Elmira Street Associates, the founder and principal, Pamela Nefakara. Pamela was a former longtime Nike vice president, um, deeply experienced brand leader with expertise in creating consumer connections through mastery of the digital ecosystem from online to physical retail. She's currently serving as a startup investor and an advisor across a spectrum of industries. Carla Santiago, she's the founder of Story Digital. She's also a digital veteran that learned the ins and outs of the marketing agency world while specializing in partnering brands with, with strategic entertainment properties. Recent, recently, she launched Story, which is a platform that connects brands with content creators such as production companies, networks, and influencers. And last but not least, we have Britton Harden, founder and CEO of Precious Minutes. Uh, he's a business development and marketing professional with experience in brand licensing strategy and partnership building across various industries.
Currently, he's leading an entertainment consultant company that represents the domestic division of Arena Holdings, one of the largest African media companies. And with that, I'll turn it over to my co-pilot, Dr. Julian St. Clair. Thanks, Mitch. I appreciate it. And welcome to our esteemed panel. Uh, it's really awesome to have you all here. Uh, I thought it worth bringing back up this uh, generic uh, statement and, and giving the audience a, a quick chance to read it. We at Brand, are, I want to read it along with you just because why not? We at Brand are committed to fighting injustice by posting images to Twitter that express our commitment to fighting injustice. To that end, we offer this solemn white on black JPEG that will express vague solidarity with the black community, but will quietly elide the specifics of what is wrong, what needs to change, or in what way, ways we will do anything about it. This is doubly true if Brand is particularly guilty of exacerbating these issues. We hope this action encourages, encourages you to view Brand positively without you expecting anything from us. Sincerely yours, Brand, you know the ones. And then we, if we compare that to, you know, Ben and Jerry's, just this quick tweet, right? George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd was a result of inhumane police brutality that is perpetuated by a culture of white supremacy along with the headline that we must dismantle white supremacy. And if you go and look at their website, um, you'll see some more details and calling on specific actions. And so I thought it um, would be a great way to, to open, open it to the panel. Um, we see a lot of the generic messages. We see a lot of the, we, we see some of the Ben and Jerry messages. Is Ben and Jerry getting it right? What's, what's going on here? And uh, arbitrarily, since Britain's on the top of my screen, Britain, you want to kick us off? Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you guys for having me. Much appreciated. This is a very important topic to be speaking about. I feel honored that you guys would choose me. I just want to say that first and foremost. Um, but I think that ben and, ben and Jerry's probably came out and said the most important um, things, right? They said the victim's name, they spoke about white supremacy, and they talked about silence not being an option. Those things as a black man were very important for me to see. And to be honest with you, the lack of seeing those three things, in particular, the victim's name, right, uh, is very hurtful and harmful as other brands who are bigger than Ben and Jerry's and have a much wider fingerprint than Ben and Jerry's um, and, and probably benefit more off of the African-American community than Ben and Jerry's were afraid to speak specifically to the, the you know, the victim's name. They, they failed to speak specifically to what the problem is. That's oppression and white supremacy. And they failed to, you know, hold themselves accountable and hold other brands accountable by saying silence is not okay in this time. So... I'm, I'm very pleased and I'm very happy because I was actually just looking up uh, Ben and Jerry's, you know, right as you guys were bringing it up on the screen and that just shows the alignment and where we all are in this conversation. But I think Ben and Jerry's probably uh, spoke the best out of any brand that I've seen, any brand message that I've seen. Awesome. Um, Pamela, you're next on my screen. Would you like to follow, with, follow it up? Absolutely. Uh, thank you guys for having me. I think uh, there are three components to an effective response in a situation like this. One of them you guys hit on in the topic of this webinar, and that's authenticity, which to me basically means that, you know, your actions back up what it is that you're saying. But I think it's also important that a response include empathy. And I think that's part of what Britton was getting at when you talked about hearing the victim's name and an acknowledgement you know, of the impact that this is having on the community. And then I think the last one is simply logic. You know, as a brand, is what you're saying and what you're doing, does that make sense for you as a brand? And I think what makes the Ben and Jerry's response so powerful is it, ben and Jerry's has a, a brand um, persona that is very personal and very playful. And for them to come at this, you know, in such a direct way and so and come at it so hard, it's, it makes a lot of sense for them as a brand because they are a very transparent brand, but that's also what makes it so impactful and so powerful. So did they get it right? You know, does anybody ever get it all the way right? I think that remains to be seen, but yeah, I agree. I think that they've had probably one of the most effective responses and that's because they've hit on all three of those components. That's awesome. Um, I, I 
I completely agree. And I love it. You also, you also touched on um, brand persona, which I definitely want to circle back to. Uh, but before we get to that, Carla, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. Um, I agree with both um, Britton and Pamela, but um, also going back to brand persona and this whole new marketing trajectory that's evolved within the last 30 years of brands being personal and intimate and selling you on a lifestyle. Well, if you're going to be personal and intimate, you have to follow through. And when you apologize and you re when you recognize something that's wrong, you have to be detailed in your response. You can't be intimate and personal and sell me your soaps and sell me your shampoos. And then all of a sudden something like this happens and you just give a blanket response. You just can't have it both ways. If you're trying to build a relationship with me as a consumer, then just like a, a, a human to human relationship, and you're trying to model that and leverage that and leverage my emotions to sell me a product, then you have to follow through all the way with everything that comes, right? And I think sometimes brands, they, they want to leverage the emotion of building a relationship to sell you. But when it comes to other things, they hold back and you can't have it both ways. Now with the internet, now with um, the transparency that exists, you just can't, you can't have it. You can't be closed off in one area and then open and building relationships on another. Awesome. Um, the idea, and the idea of brand relationships is a, uh, is a huge one. Um, and I think it does touch on, on, uh, especially the Pamela's point about empathy is exactly what I agree that sound, sound like Britain was talking about that as well. Um, related to that, I want to go ahead and segue to the larger question to hear some initial thoughts on what is it that makes brand engagement in, in black lives matter or any social or political narrative narratives, what makes it, authentic or inauthentic. And um, let's go reverse order. So Carla, if you wanna kick us off on that. Awesome. Um, what makes it authentic is that it aligns with what you actually believe in. So a lot of brands, um, interestingly enough, I had to expose a brand that I worked for, a company that I worked for, and that put up a Black Lives Matter um, post, but the company had zero black employees. And the ones that they did have, they didn't treat well. So, you know, if you want to be authentic, I think you have to, I don't think, you have to first start looking at your infrastructure and your employees and ask yourself, are we, you know, are, what are we doing wrong, right? Be a little introspective of like what you're doing with your employees because going back to the whole brand persona story, a lot of brands believe that their employees are part of the culture, they're part of the story, they're part of the product. Well, if that's the case, let's reverse and go back to the start and see how many black employees do you have? How many uh, executives with, with position-making power? How many of them are getting equity? Okay, so you can go around and say anything you want about Black Lives Matter, but start from your internal organization and it, if you do that then your messaging is more authentic <clears throat> that's awesome and it, I, it might have just been my end i was getting a little static um but I, what I, from what i heard you say uh if i could do a quick recap um there was a, also a brand you were working with they wanted to make a black lives matter statement but uh they had like no black employees and you're recommending that brands look internally to, to their own structure including who's in leadership was that uh, uh accurate exactly yeah it's 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 who's in leadership in your organization are you empowering your black employees are you you know this this is not new been going on for quite a while and i have heard from other black colleagues telling me like oh you know when these stats come up i have to go back to work in, in the office it's like acknowledging the grief Is, technical difficulties with Carla. Um, Julian, I'm going to okay. need you to summarize. Sure. Uh, Carla, maybe we'll circle back uh, again, but from okay. what I heard, you, you, you relate a story of uh, uh, some Black colleagues who were saying that their work was asking them to go back to work amidst all the, everything that was happening and uh, without ever really giving them any support about um, um, what's going on with the current movement and giving thoughts of how they might be feeling and, and empowering them as well. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, and not just now, but in the last decade that all these, like with the news being um, videos coming up and all these cases coming up, you know, now, but before then, people had to show up to work yeah. and pretend it didn't affect them. Mm. And so it goes down to that 
like cellular level of employee to employer relationship, right? It just, it starts there. And if your company haven't had that conversation, you haven't been sensitive to that, then start there. Start there. And I respect a company that has made decisions to hire more black employees, to uplift and support black employees. I'd rather have you talk about that than telling me like, oh, we're gonna donate a million dollars to Black Lives Matter. Thank you, but what are you doing internally? Awesome. Um, can I jump in real quick, Julian? Um, yeah, please. This is just some uh, logistics stuff I, I, I forgot to mention early on. We're gonna hold Q and A for the, for the end of the webinar. And so if you just submit your questions or, or, or do a hand raise, we'll keep count and then we'll get to your questions at the end because we're, we have some participants that are, that, that are submitting questions and raising hands now and I don't want them to think we're, we're ignoring them. We'll get yeah. to you. Great, thanks Mitch. Um, awesome, Carla, thank you so much. Um, Pamela. What made the, the original question was, um, what, generally speaking, what makes brand engagement in social political narratives authentic or inauthentic? Yeah, I think Carla articulated the broad strokes of that very well. You know, you can't say one thing, but then when we lift up the covers, you know, we see something completely different. Now, I encourage everyone to don't just go to a, a brand or a company's web page and look at what's on the home screen scroll down to the bottom and in the area that's typically called the footer, you know, click on about or click on, you know, uh, about our company, go digging, look for governance, uh, and then keep clicking until you can get to the list of names of the board of directors of that company. And it's been, it's really interesting, the more companies you do that for, one, uh, you'll find a lot of companies don't include photos of their board of directors on their website. So we should be asking ourselves, well, why is that? So what does your board look like? Is it reflective of, you know, the community? So if you go a little deeper and you, you know, look at those names, is that a female, is that a male? Like, you know, you have to go in and do a little bit of more research to really figure out what leadership at companies look like, because it's the leaders who are sitting at the table and making the decisions about what a company is or isn't going to do. You know, what's happening now? Mm, I lost audio for Pamela. Mitch, can you hear Pamela? If you can. Uh, you know, her screen froze up on my end too. Uh, maybe we'll, we can circle back to her as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, I can jump in if you guys sure, need. Please. Pamela, yeah, you froze up on us, so we didn't catch a lot of what you said towards the end. Okay, thanks. Is better now? Actually, yeah. Okay. Shall I keep going or Britain? Do yeah, you? no, please go for it. Pamela, yeah, I think we can hear you now. Uh, so what I was saying is that, you know, companies aren't responsible for solving personal problems, but they are responsible for addressing societal problems, because every brand and every company is simply a reflection of the communities in which they operate. And so if something is not right in a community, then I think every brand and every company does have a duty to act to address it. And I think where a lot of folks get this uh, mixed up is they look at their employees of color, you know, their black employees, Latinx, whatever, and they think somehow that this is a personal problem just for those employees, when in fact, it is a community and a societal issue. And every brand needs to be thinking about that. Wow, I love that perspective. Thank you. Um, Britton, what makes engagement in social political narratives authentic or inauthentic? I mean, for me, it's fairly simple. It's action, right? It's not, it's not in changing your logo to black and white. It's not into, you know, an IG post in black and white saying that you support Black Lives Matter, any other, you know, cause for that matter. Um, it's in the authenticity. It's in the action. It's in what you do to support me when I'm down. It's in what you do to support me and my community when we need you. If you benefit from my community, if you benefit from if your bottom line benefits from the African-American dollar, then how do you show up for me in times of need? 
right? Implicit in the statement Black Lives Matter is also that Black opinions matter and Black opportunity matters and Black representation matters. So are you providing opportunities to people uh, internally in your company, right? And really empowering them to have a voice, really helping them to uh, navigate the corporate environment to get to a place of equity? Are you really supporting um, my community, right? Not just me, right? I want to know that I'm supported. I wanna know that my community is supported and I wanna know that the opportunities, the representation and my voice actually matters to you. So, you know, Carla gave a, a brilliant example of, you know, or, and Pamela as well of, you know, what does your executive board look like? What does your C-suite look like? You know, are we represented in leadership in your company? And me, I'll take it even a step further because I believe that now is a time to really be insatiable in our request to companies that we patronize and support. How much money do you actually make off the African American community quarterly? How much money do you make in a year? And are you willing to give us a, you know, a, a healthy percentage of that invested into communities of ours that really need to be replenished and really need to be taken care of? For me, that is how you know you really show up and you support. If you say Black Lives Matter, then that's how you show up for me, and that's how I'll know it's authentic. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm also I'm seeing some themes around employee and internal empowerment and, and and equity within the company, and a related theme of community empowerment and community investment, which is external to the company. Um, but it's still looking at who are all the stakeholders that are being affected by this company and how are we really, really empowering them. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, so I want to share my screen again. Let's see here. So this is the Ben and Jerry's statement and I'm going to, uh, pardon the Photoshop skills, but if you can see, we swapped it out to, to show Walmart. Why doesn't that work? Uh, and sure, Carla, go for it. You're muted actually right now, Carla, sorry. You're muted again. There we go. Okay, um, because, can you hear me? Yes. Because they don't have a history of that. They don't have the same history. And you can't just like, I'll, I'll like jump out of the blue talking about something that you don't have a history of having that conversation. You're not having that conversation. It seems opportunistic. Yeah, it seems opportunistic, I'm hearing you say. Um, great, Pamela? Yeah. Well, it also doesn't work because that's Ben and Jerry's um, logo and typeface, right? Which is a big reason why that statement is so powerful that they are willing to leverage their image and you know an iconic look that's so closely associated with their brand with that statement uh, and that for someone to just you know change that to walmart is illogical which was one of the three uh things that i talked about a company that needed to have they needed to have authenticity empathy and logic so you know for ben and jerry's to leverage their own typeface and image to make a statement that strongly is very, very powerful. What a company or any company, what Walmart needs to do or any other company needs to do is think about, well, what's logical for them? What's logical for them based on their company values, their company's history um, and you know their mission. And that's how you craft something that's much more authentic and makes a lot bigger statement for you. Awesome. So, so Pamela, so you're saying you didn't like my Photoshop skills. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we like so much about you, Mitch. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Britton, what are your thoughts? Why doesn't this work? It's cheap. You know, it's inauthentic. The same thing that the lady said. I think that what was absent in the room when Walmart uh, made that statement was probably um, a failure to ask pertinent questions, like who qualifies us to actually make a statement, right? And what I mean by that is, is the oppressed or the afflicted by this matter in the room? Because I'm sure that if somebody that was black was in the room, they would have said that is a carbon copy of what someone else said and it's inauthentic and it's actually very offensive to me. Whereas a, you know, as a, um, a committed member of this team, 
you know, I think that we should uh, say something that's a little bit more authentic to who we are as a company. Awesome. Awesome. A great, great responses. I want to circle back to that topic as well, especially the topic of mission and, and, and history. Um, but before we get there and, and lead, to lead us to that discussion, uh, I'm going to pull up another visual. Um, Colin Kaepernick, I would love to talk a little bit about the NFL. So for a super quick recap, Kaepernick wanted to protest. He was advised by a military veteran that kneeling during the anthem was a respectful way to protest. Uh, and then uproar ensues and the NFL was not supportive. In fact, Kaepernick filed a collusion case against the NFL, uh, accusing them of conspiring to hurt his career. And the NFL agreed to pay him a reported $10 million to drop the case before it went to trial. So to say that the NFL wasn't supportive might be a little bit of an understatement. Um, <clears throat> the question uh, I wanna talk about here, or actually, I'm sorry, to, to go to the update recently, um, the NFL players without the NFL league's permission, just amongst themselves made this video, uh, in support of black lives matter. And, uh, it kind of put the NFL in an awkward position. And so it essentially kind of forced the hand of the NFL to respond. So the commissioner uh, made this statement. He recorded a video, went on, uh, on social media elsewhere and posted it. We, the NFL condemn racism and the systemic oppression of black people. We, the NFL, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. We, the NFL, believe Black Lives Matter inspire change. Um, so my question to the panel is, what do we think of this pivot? Where we talked a little bit about the reason the Walmart statement wouldn't have worked very well. It's not aligned with the history. We don't know who's in the room, who is influence, influencing this decision. NFL wasn't supportive before, but now they're coming out and saying we're wrong. Are we okay with them now? Are they on the right side of history? What do we, what do we think? Let's start with, uh, with Britain. So um, very, very interesting topic. And you know, one that gets a lot of uh, airtime and a lot of my group threads um, as black men, this is something that we talk about all the time. I'm of the thought that we should start to treat brands as if they're people, right? And if we're treating brands as if they're people, then we expect them to have an opinion. But also if we're treating brands like they're people, then we allow space for them to uh, be wrong and make mistakes and atone for those mistakes. Now, when you are atoning for your mistake and you're admitting that you're wrong, you have to be genuine in your action to have a uh, genuine relationship with me. And what that means is you don't get to create um, a narrative based off of your own logic of why you were wrong and what I need um, from you for us to have a genuine relationship again. You have to come to my to me and ask me, hey, Britain, how can I be at your aid? African-American community, how can I be at your aid? What do you need to see from me? What changes do you need to see from us as an organization so that you understand that we wanna get this thing right? And so, um, you know, I think that the NFL, they've realized we have majority of our uh, of our players that we make so much money off of are African-American. They're very upset right now. They've been upset for a long time. They've been oppressed for a long time. I think now is the perfect time, not only for them to make statements like the ones that they made, but also start to have conversations in those locker rooms and in those executive boards where there are African-American representation and even act and even going to the communities, right? Where the, they, they have uh, prevalent franchises and ask, what can we do? you know, to, to get this thing right with you because we haven't always been right, but we want to do something different now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Pamela. Yeah, I love what Britton said about, you know, making space for someone who once they realize that they're wrong, you know, giving them space to make it right. And I think <laughs> in addition to everything he said, if you think about the NFL or the NBA or, you know, any professional sports organization, again, it's a reminder that first and foremost, this is an organization. There's a management team and there are employees. And if you look at the leadership structure of the NFL, which is majority white, most of the owners, right, the owners are white and the employees for the most part are not. 
So it's no different than looking at a company who has a board of directors and a leadership team who is majority white, but an employee base or a customer base, you know, who is not. And it's just playing out in a different arena, no pun intended, than in the corporate world. But again, same, same issues here as Mitch, you talked about in your intro, you know, are these organizations thinking about that triple bottom line? Are they just thinking about profit or are they also taking into consideration, you know, people and the planet? And that's where the NFL sorely, sorely misstepped. Hopefully they're now seeing the error of their ways. And I think only time will tell if in fact, you know, true change is going to happen. Awesome. Carla, I know you've done a bunch of work in, in this and other spaces that are related. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do we like the NFL now? Are they, are they good? Hey, okay, going back to like having a relationship. <clears throat> I'm glad you admitted you're wrong. What are you going to do about it? So like Britton said earlier, be insatiable. Let's follow up. Okay, it's been a month. What are the changes that the NFL has, done, has made to change the demographic of the people who are in decision making, equity positions? Uh, what are the changes? And I think we can't just be happy with an apology, just like in a relationship, if someone apologizes to you, you also want to see the actions follow up with that, with that response, right? I, I, I'm not about cancel culture. I'm so happy that that was a genuine, that looked like a genuine apology it was detailed. But what's next? What are you going to do next to prove to me that you actually mean what you're saying? And that's honestly all I have to say. I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that they said that. I'm mean, sad it took this long and all these things happen. But what's the follow up? Um, we are still getting a little bit of audio issues, uh, Carla. Uh, and one suggestion was maybe to try lowering the volume. Okay. Um, but if I'm, what I'm hearing you say is uh, it's, it's great. Apology might have actually been solid, good detail, but what's the action that's going to follow that? And, and what is the concrete? change like in a relationship if you're apologizing to me um i accept you know i appreciate the apology um but what are, what are the behavioral changes that are going to happen which i think is a great point so uh let's look at this next well are you oh, okay you're gonna jump i was gonna say no please feel free no i was gonna say well they have a pretty unique follow-up to that that i was yeah you're gonna introduce yeah here, awesome. here, you, here you go right here this is this is the nfl will play lift every voice and sing before each season opener game so in season one or excuse me, week one, week one, they're going to play what's the Black National Anthem. Is that enough? Is that, is that what do we think of that? <laughs> I, I don't think, Jillian, you're going to get any of the panel to say that. that <laughs> and again, I mean, I hate going back to my model, but where is the logic in that? You know, where is the logic in that? What has that got to do with, you know, the the structure of their organization or uh, the way that they've treated their players or what what issue is that exactly addressing? Uh, where's the education? Is there some education that's going to come, you know, for the fans behind that? I can imagine these stadiums full of people who've never even heard this song before who are like, you know, what's going on? So there is no logic in that. You know, their answer needs to be commensurate with the behaviors of the past. Uh, and so playing a, the Black National Anthem uh, at the beginning of every, and it, it's only the season opener game, so it's a one and done deal. You know, what is that solving? Yeah. Can I jump yeah. in for one second? Please. I, I, I feel like this is like a, an operationalized version of that generic brand statement, you know? Because <laughs> at the end of the day, they're still not allowing their players to use their platform, you know, to, to um, inform people and engage in social justice issues. And so it, it, I just find that almost comical. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like brownwashing. That's, you know how there's greenwashing. Oh, we made this from recycled plastic, but it's still plastic or whatever. This is brownwashing, which it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't answer anything. I, I agree. I think that, you know, like I said from the very beginning, I think that this is our time to be insatiable in our request of the brands that we patronize, right? If I spend a lot of money with you, if I spend a lot of time with you, then we're in some form of a relationship. And if we're in a relationship, I expect you to be invested in my well-being. And if you're not invested in my well-being, you need to have some type of opinion that, that makes me understand why you don't care at this moment, right? They didn't have a logical explanation for why they got rid of CAP. 
They didn't have a logical explanation for why they didn't want uh, players to kneel. They didn't have a logical explanation for why they allowed themselves to be bullied when the majority of the players are African-American people. I get it, you know, capital, whatever, but this is the time, right? And so my fear even in that play is that because African-American people, black people are very compassionate and understanding is that we'll see that and we'll say, hey, they do get it. And they did give us an apology, but how does that make up for the lack of African-American representation and ownership of teams? How does that make up for the lack of executive opportunities, C-suite opportunities, you know what I mean? Level playing field for, you know, the players to use their, uh, their, their uh, you know, the platforms that they've worked all their lives to have, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't really care about you playing a, a national anthem at the beginning of, you know, a game when my people are still suffering, but we're spending millions and millions of dollars with you either in television or in ticket sales a year, you know, I show me how to how, show me how you're willing to make this thing right. And, you know, singing a song over a loudspeaker isn't going to do that for me. I apologize. I love it. I completely agree. And to add my own thought, it's like they were in the room and the question they asked was, what's the smallest and least thing we can do that might appease some people? And this was the solution. Whereas the better question I would encourage all brands and organizations at every level to ask is what else, what more can we be doing to, uh, to address systemic racism and just keep asking that question, you know, at every executive meeting. Um, I want to, I want I'm hoping that we can briefly touch on one more topic before we get to Q and a, and that topic is, um, uh, I lost my screen. That topic is, I'll speak through it with this example. This is a uh, politics being injected into football and de deflating. I'm talking you through the joke, but it's politics. There's a comic of politics being in injected into a football and deflating the football. Obviously, the idea is that politics is ruining the game of football. That's the idea. <clears throat> so just building on the NFL example, the issue of Kaepernick kneeling became extremely political, where on the one side you have the social justice narrative, and on the other there's this counter narrative about being unpatriotic or disrespecting the flag which is, you know, the kneeling idea originated in a conversation with a veteran uh, and has, had, has seen huge support from veterans organizations. And if we, if we believe that veterans are the ultimate patriots and veterans are supportive of this, then it kind of makes that counter narrative fall flat. And, it, and it, you know, we can say with some confidence that that counter narrative was politically motivated uh, as a distraction. But nevertheless, it put the NFL in this position of having to choose political sides, right? Where whether they go with one side or the other, they're going to be alienating the other side. And so there's this interesting risk that happens when brands want to engage in social and political narratives um, that might attract and resonate with one segment of their audience, but it might also alienate another segment of their audience. And I know we've talked about NFL a bunch here, but you know, there's uh, building on that Nike supporting Kaepernick and people then burning Nike shoes sometimes while wearing them. Uh, Chick-fil-A leadership speaking out against gay marriage, Dick Sporting Goods ending assault rifle sales and calling for gun reform after school shootings. And so there's, there's a few examples we can talk about. But the question for the panel is, how should brands manage this risk of potentially resonating with one side but alienating uh, a different segment of your audience? And um, uh, uh, Carla, would you like to start? I think <clears throat> one of the things that the, the first thing that needs to be talked about is, is this a political issue or is this just a moral issue, right? When brands are like, oh, we don't want to talk about Black Lives Matter because we don't want to be polarizing and we don't want to be political. This is not about being political. Black men disproportionately being killed by the cops. That is not about politics. That's not about like putting more funding into downtown. No, that could be political, but this is not political. This is moral. So you know, to even talk about it, it's almost a little um, insulting. Because by, by just mentioning it that it's political, you're telling me that you don't see this as a moral issue. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's go, Britton. Yeah, like Carla said, man, I think that, you know, to, to make this just a political issue is very, um, 
it's hurtful, you know, like we're talking about blood being spilled and we're talking about lives being lost. And I think at the end of the day, as a brand, when you, when you choose to engage in these, um, in a social narrative, you're going to segment some part of the, of your, of your, you know, your, your audience, your patronage, right? So I think that people or these brands rather need to just understand where they want to be in 50 years. 75 years, 100 years from now, how do you want to be reflected in history? When your children or your grandchildren look back on 2020 and they say, wow, that was a crazy year, you know, how did you show up? You know, that's more so the, 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 the energy and the logic that I'm leaning into, um, you know, as we are, you know, reaching the, the mid part of the year is how do I want to show up in 2020? How do I want to be able to tell my grandkids I represented myself and my people? Right. And so for these brands who are figuring out if they're going to waver or not, making a statement is dangerous, not making a statement is dangerous. So you need to just figure out which one is most genuine to you, who qualifies you to make the statement. Right. Like I said before, when it comes to Walmart, when it came to the Walmart situation, the reason why they missed the mark was because they probably probably didn't they weren't qualified to make a statement. Right. It's not a bunch of, you know, and I'm only using this word, I'll say non-African-American people saying, this is what black people want to hear right now. It's who's African-American in our organization that has been impacted by this. Let's pull them in a room. Let's empower them to have a voice. And what would you like for, if this was a conversation and something happened to you directly, how would you want me to show up for you, right? It's not just um, a political thing. It's not just about dollars. It's about being right when you know everything is said and done in history how do you want to show up awesome awesome thank you pamela and then we'll go to a q a yeah i think every brand should know who their most important audience or consumer is and frankly i think that the lack of response by the nfl in the past has you know been very calculated they have been thinking about who they care to alienate or not and the choices that they made illustrate that very clearly, that they cared more about their owners or what their sponsors might say than the large majority of their uh, African-American audience. Uh, same thing with Nike. You know, Nike knows who their core consumer is. And a lot of the people that you saw burning their sneakers are not the people that Nike would identify as their key consumer or their most important consumer. So it, again, it comes back to what do you stand for? You know, who, who is it that you're addressing, you know, as a brand or as an organization? And is that the right, you know, group that makes sense in terms of your mission and what you're trying to accomplish? And I think what the NFL is learning is by ignoring a huge part of their audience that, that this issue didn't go away and it, it won't go away for them until they do something that's truly authentic and meaningful and empathetic and, and very logical. So all brands need to be thinking this way and all brands, you know, by default, you know, they think this way. That's why so many brands haven't said anything because they're worried about alienating who they truly see as their core consumer. Awesome. Awesome. Can I Thank jump you. in before we throw it to the audience? Sure, I, please. I actually wanted to say this to the audience as well is that um, so we're actually we're currently able to watch this play out where we have two organizations that are pretty equal in size and impact with the NFL and the NBA who, who took polar opposite approaches to the exact same social issue. And so we're going to get to see how this plays out right before our eyes. So it's just something interesting that's happening right now. Yeah, completely agree. Um, awesome. Really wonderful responses and great insights. Um, I, I, I think but now we should definitely go to Q&A. Um, uh, Dale, are you yeah, facilitating I that? I'm awesome. on and I've been tracking the questions. Um, Patty and Narika, if you put on my video, although you guys can hear my voices. We had a hand up, but it went down. Laura and, uh, Mabuni, if you still had a question to ask, if you could raise your hand. Um, our first question comes from Isabel. How do we keep the executives of our companies accountable for making future business decisions on the public statements they're issuing now. Uh, Pamela, you want to start us off, please? We have to be steadfast. You know, there's no substitute for uh, 
as you know, advocates, whether you're an employee in that organization or a consumer um, or some other um, interested or engaged party, uh, you have to remain steadfast. You have to keep reminding uh, leadership what promises they made. You have to keep demanding transparency uh, around those promises and that progress. I mean, already now, um, if you go to pick a website, you know, Apple, Nike, you know, lots of big brands. I'm not seeing these statements on the home pages of their website anymore. Ben and Jerry's is actually one of the exceptions where it's still, you know, very prominent, very high up uh, on their website. You know, who is continuing to report in a very public way about their uh, activities? You know, it didn't take, it, it took us a really long time to get to this point in history. So that means it may take us just as long to get uh, beyond these issues and to solve these issues. So this is not about just what's happening, you know, this month or this year. This is really like what's going to be happening over the next decades and how are companies, you know, going to stay on it and not slip back as they will do if we let up in our own scrutiny. Awesome. Britton or Carla, anything to add or should we hop to another question? I know, uh, Julian, there are a bunch of other questions. It's up to you guys how you want to manage. Okay, sure. We can go to the next question. Um, so this comes from Matt who wants to know, how do you advise a men's retailer with historically white consumer base who wants to be more diverse in their brand imagery but when they feature their models in it, their clothes in non-white models, then the sales lower for the items. Excellent question. Um, Britton or Carla, either of you care to jump in? Go ahead. That's a, that's a very interesting question. I mean, listen, like I know at the end of the day, you know, um, revenue uh, is, is uh, the bottom line has to make sense, right? If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. But I think that if you understand, you know, as a, as a brand owner, you understand who you want to communicate, you know who you want to be, then I would say uh, charter a path forward and do it anyway, right? I think that, you know, just because a, a net, uh, one segment probably doesn't like when, uh, you know, you depict your brand as being, you know, a multicultural brand, you may end up picking up more patronage, you know, from a different segment if you continue to charter a path for it and you're brave, right? Other than that, and if you didn't have that DNA already in you to charter a path when people told you to do something different, you probably wouldn't be a business owner anyway. So I would say continue to do it. Awesome. Carla, anything to add? I think also if, if, if you know, going back to Pamela's um, point, if your target demographic is white, right? Um, and you see this in beauty, and you see this in other areas, then if you still want to deliver a more diverse message, then use, you know, diverse people that speak or influencers that speak to your white demographic. Like sometimes people think, oh, this actor or this influencer is black, so therefore their audience is black. Not really, not true. I mean, Mitch, we worked with Snoop, the majority of his followers are white. Right, so you you know you can use talent in that way, um, leverage a, a smaller influencer that does speak to a white audience in a way to like bring in the sales. So there are other solves to to this type of situation where you can still be diverse, you can still have a multicultural message without alienating your target audience. Awesome, and I'm seeing that some follow ups about mixed. Um, representation in your models and Mitch and I actually are working with another colleague of ours named Esther on a, on a project about diversity in advertising and the short version is exactly what Britton and Carla just talked about which is you will attract diverse audiences with diverse people and even if you might alienate one you'll attract new people. Um, so let's go to another question just to see if we can yeah, get a couple uh, more. Our please. next question, this is the last question from the chat and then we'll go to the Q&A in order of response. Um, Mike asks, how would the panelists go about changing uh, the Washington Redskins name? Ooh, that's a good one. Pamela, you want to start off, please? <laughs> I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I, I can't help myself <laughs> around this question. Uh, time's up. I mean, come on. 
like this conversation again has been going on for a really, really, really long time. And I think if we can recognize the fact that Columbus did not discover America, we got to recognize how, you know, naming the, this team name is so offensive. You know, if, if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, you've said this to me and I find this offensive, how you just continue to ignore that, you know, time and time and time again, uh, that it just, it needs to be a done deal, right along with Aunt Jemima. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I think, we, I think I, I would imagine Britton and Carla probably agree. Um, can we go to, go to the next question or do we have more? Uh, we do, we have, uh, we'll probably run out of time before we have to hit all the questions, but cool. know that the dialogue can certainly continue offline. I know our faculty continually engage. This question comes from Gilda. We've talked about giving space for people and brands to right their wrongs and make changes within their structure to dismantle systemic racism. However, cancel culture, in quotes, is very present in today's society where exposing people and brands happens quite often. What are the panel's thoughts on this idea of cancel culture, especially when it comes to brands? Carla, you touched on this earlier. You wanna kick us off with that? I think we should cancel cancel culture. Um, just like, it also comes down to our individualistic perspective that's very Western and American where, oh, you know, you pissed me off, that's it, you're over, like there's no, there's excommunication. So you have to un understand that a lot of it has to come from our even our interpersonal culture. And if we start being more community minded, then we know that, you know what, I'm here for you until you change. I'm here for you to, to make that change and I'm going to support you. But when you have cancel culture, you're just cutting everybody off you're not you're not building anything you're and and what you're doing is you're um the people with you know bad like what do you call it um the people on the wrong side of history you're just supporting them you're just making them believe what they believe even more so i believe cancel cancel culture i believe in having dialogue communication and acting more like a community to dismantle white supremacy Awesome. Britton, you talked about uh, bringing people into the room to have those conversations. You want to add to Car what Carla just said? Well, first off, I wanted to just say something. We've all seen this, like, uh, you know, these stories about canceling people and not giving people a chance to atone, right? If we would have canceled Malcolm Little when he was a drug dealer, a drug addict and a criminal, we would have never got Malcolm X. We would have never saw that maturation, right? And that is you know, one of the most prolific figures in, in terms of speaking for the oppressed. Um, and so I think that this, this narrative of cancel culture and canceling people, not giving them an opportunity to atone, boxing into the mistakes that they've made um, in their past doesn't allow us the opportunity to, one, see the maturation process that they can go through, and then not giving them the opportunity to become the biggest advocate for uh you know causes like this right um and, and and you know to speak you know to your direct question these brands you know the reason why these these responses are so carbon copy and they miss the mark and they seem so stale and cold is because either they're not empowering the oppressed person in the room right to actually speak up and give the statement themselves or it's a, a, a brain trust in a think tank of non-African American people saying, yeah, this is what they want to hear, right? This will make them happy. This is what Nike did. This is what Ben and Jerry's did. It's not authentic to you. You can't do the same thing that they do. You know what I mean? You're, you don't have the same ethos as a company as they have. So you have to, one, these brands need to ask the question, what and who qualifies us to make a statement that's first and foremost two do we have that representation in the room three have we given them the real empowerment to speak to this or have we oppressed them every time they've come into the room and given us an opportunity we've seen so many brands fashion brands uh fast food restaurants and i can you know keep going down the list who create these um either these clothing, you know, uh, pieces of clothing or these commercials that miss the mark with black people. You know what I mean? It shows us like shucking and jiving for chicken or it shows blackface on t-shirts and shoes or you get the flyest monkey in the jungle. It's like, did you not empower the people who look like the oppressed 
to actually have a voice when it comes to these campaigns. It's clear that you didn't because either you don't have them in the room or you, 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 know, you shun them every time they try to tell you because any person would tell you that's not where it's at. And so I think that, you know, again, to, you know, just kind of reiterate who qualifies me to make a statement? Do I have them in the room? And have I empowered them? And if I haven't, then I need to do all three of those things. Beautifully said. Uh, Pamela, from your experience, I imagine you've been in some of these rooms. Would you like to speak to the topic? I was definitely thinking that, you know, many times I've been the only black person, the only woman, the only woman and black person in the room. And I love the example of the monkey in the jungle reference that Britain gave, which was uh, from H&M and a t-shirt that showed up in their catalog. And the reason that example is so powerful is because there is a, an entire corporate process to designing, manufacturing, and promoting garments in, you know, for any brand. So what that means is that every step along the way of that process, there was no one uh, to raise their hand. And importantly, it doesn't just mean that there, you know, by definition was no person of color at the table, because even if there had been a person of color at the table, a lot of times if you're the only person of color at the table, there's huge risk involved in you being the one to raise your hand and to speak up. And that's why it's so important that these conversations are happening, not just, you know, among black people, but uh, among everyone. You know, I think the Me Too movement did us a favor in helping us to understand that it wasn't the responsibility of women to solve sexual harassment. In that same way, it is not the responsibility of black people to solve the question of racism. I love it. I love it. Um, I know we're, we're basically out of time. Um, and so, um, Dale, Mitch, you guys want to, want to wrap it up for us? Uh, Mitch, did you, you have comments? There's so many good questions here. I wish we had another hour. Um, I tried to save them all so that the discussion can continue, but I encourage our audience members who have their questions that we didn't get to, um, to please send an email to, um, our, uh, professors, uh, Jillian and Mitch, and I'm sure they'd be willing to uh, reach out to, um, our wonderful panelists today. Um, any closing remarks before I close it off, Mitch? No, I just wanted to reiterate that um, we are videotaping and you'll be able to access this to the audience. And so um, some of you have um, asked about contact information. We shared it earlier on, so you can go back and revisit that. You can also reach out to me or Dr. St. Clair and we can, and we can uh, get you in contact with them as well. And I, awesome job. I knew yeah, you guys thanks, were to, thanks to everybody. And I want to thank all of our audience. Um, we kept over uh, 90 people were in the room today for the discussion. And I just want to thank everyone for engaging with us today and invite you to join us next Thursday. We're going to pivot our conversation a little bit to how do you start up a business during COVID and how to market to Gen Z. Um, and interestingly enough, our panelists that day will be 98. These are a group of students who graduated this year in May and they've started their own creative advertising agency that was created at LMU and in the marketing department. So bravo to the marketing professors who inspired this group at 98. And my hope is they'll connect to a lot of what we talked about today because they understand a new generation that wants the world to be a very, very different place. So I don't know about all of you, but my bet, my hope is in the next generation coming up who can start to repair the world. So thanks again to everybody, um, and we'll hopefully see you next Thursday. Thank you.